Okay, so everyone, uh, welcome to this to the uh, second presentation of our small LMS online research seminar series. Uh, our speaker today is, uh, is Nicole Adler. Uh, he, she is from the University of Jerusalem, uh, Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and she's a very busy person uh, because she is uh, not only a professor over there, but she's also the dean of the Department of Operations, Research and Operations Management. And I can imagine that as a dean, you are you must be incredibly busy. Uh, in your bio, you mention a lot of topics that you are working on. Uh, Nicole, and I feel that the talk today is basically what you're working on for a very long time. So I think this is like game theory, congestion, uh, applied to some aviation uh, background. And I, I personally, uh, uh, Nicole and I, we know each other for really, really, I would say a very long time, since the beginning of my academic life, I would say, because she was uh, attending uh, my first presentation in English language, which, you know, uh, I get that is, and that was more than, I guess, maybe around 20 years ago. Uh, so that's uh, interesting how, how time flies. I don't want to take any other more time from your, no, from no. you, Nicole, and uh, it's, it's wonderful that you are here, that we can do this. I want to thank all the participants from joining all over the world. Uh, I mean, this is uh, wonderful, and uh, yeah, Nicole, please uh, go ahead with your presentation. Thank you. Maybe you can just share with them how, how you want to handle questions. Um, there's a chat box, but then also people can unmute themselves, also show the video. Uh, thank you, Achim, for the invitation. I really do appreciate it. Um, um, I would say that uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, thank you for coming. I think that um, following chats is going to be too hard um, to keep up with what I'm trying to do. So if you have a question, please just speak. Just turn on your audio and, and, and ask the question. That would be great. It's always nice to know that I'm not just talking to the air as well. Um, and the work that I'm going to talk about today, is, it's actually sort of, it's still a working paper. It's um, like third round at a at one of these brilliant journals. And so um, I still have a final last chance to improve stuff. So any questions or comments are very welcome. This is work that I have been doing with Iran Hanani from Tel Aviv University, who I also admit to um, being married to, sharing um, an apartment with for the, for the past two months. <laughs> and we're living in hope that maybe at some point soon we'll be able, we'll be allowed out. And of course, with Steph Proust, who is the, the most amazing transport economist from KU Leuven. Um, and without him, this would not have happened at all. It was part of a, it's actually part of two Horizon 2020 projects that we have been working on. But this, this is um, moving, moving on into the much more theoretical side of this story. So I will explain a little bit about what is air traffic control um, and specifically in Europe, just for five minutes. For those that have never thought about this, it is one, an additional link in the supply chain. Uh, it is a service provided to airlines um, by companies that um, Basically, there, every country has its own company that's providing this service. And of course, it's basically to prevent accidents. So it's kind of um, a strange industry in that it's trying to prevent something from happening rather than doing something. Um, the European system would appear to be relatively inefficient. And the European Union has tried um, several ways to improve this market. And one of their ways was to try and reduce the number of suppliers by creating what they call uh, FABs or functional airspace blocks. And they passed a law in 2004 that all um, member states um, signed on to, um, whereby uh, they were going to create what you can see here. So, so there's a simple FAB like UK and Ireland, which is simply um, joining two to uh, suppliers horizontally. Fabic, which is this lovely blue one in the center here, um, is composed of many, many countries. I think it's between 10 or 12 countries in total. Um, 
the member states signed up for it. It was to be in place by 2012, and to the, to date, this has not happened at all. There, there is basically absolutely no horizontal collaboration. And the interesting question, of course, is what? Why is that? Um, the Europeans continued to try and improve this system, and what they did was they prevented the individual states from setting their uh, charges for for the Air, air traffic control services um, by moving it from the states where it was kind of based on cost plus regulation to the EU level um, and um, they used a price cap approach and from 2010 to 2015 they uh, set the X percentage at approximately 1%. So it's a standard X across all of the different um, ANSP the, the air traffic control providers, and uh, from 2015 to 2020, that basically continued. In other words, mm, this system is very weak, but they have at least been collecting data for a long time. Um, about a year and a half ago, I was lucky enough to work with uh, Peter Bogitoft and um, Nicola Volta, and we tried to estimate the levels of inefficiency using both stochastic frontier analysis and data and development analysis. We found massive variations across the system. We found an average inefficiency level of 30%. And um, they used this to try and push um, um, for more, um, for, for, for a higher X from 2020 to 2024 inclusive. Um, I think they managed to, they're in the, still in the process, believe it or not, but like they managed to increase it to 2%. However, of course, this current pandemic is going to change that, everything on its head. So, um, in fact, my entire talk is all about congestion. And unfortunately, of course, th this is going to be only relevant. It may be five years down the line. Um, what happened again was a lot of work had been done to try and figure out how to handle congestion back in 99. Um, in 2007, the congestion also went crazy again. Um, the governments have spent a lot of money on developing technologies in Europe. This is called CESAL. In uh, the United States, it's called um, NextGen for next generation uh, provision. Um, they've each spent over 3 billion euros of taxpayers' money on developing these technologies uh, because um, for example, the delays in 2007 were quite astronomical. There's um, an interesting paper by Nextdoor that m measured the, the sums in the region of 30, 37 billion dollars in the one year. Um, but of course, 2009 came along and the financial crisis and the crunch went away. And so the pressures went away too. Um, I would say that, of course, this, this is re-rolling, I'm assuming we will get back to the kind of congestion we've been talking about. And therefore, we are interested in trying to figure out how to uh, motivate the system to improve both the technology being used and to um, encourage more cost efficiency. But to do this simultaneously is clearly not simple. One of the other motivations um, behind the, the European Union trying to change the system was their comparison to the American system, which um, has a single uh, provider, the FAA, uh, across across the US and for the vast majority of airports too, where, where ATC exists in the towers. And they saw that the European system is anywhere between one third and 50% more expensive than the American system. And the question, of course, is why? And one can think of many potential reasons for this. Um, one could be ownership form. Um, and um, actually, we have a paper in Transportation Research Part A in 2019 that does show that ownership form has a serious impact on cost and productive efficiency. But of course, the FAA is also a government organization. So in this case, the comparison doesn't work. One, one that is different is the fragmentation. So the European Union system uh, is probably missing economies of scale because every country has its own provider and some of these countries are very small. 
another another story that we can clearly see for example is that across the european union system we know that there are 63 air control centers that are dealing with en route air traffic control so the cruise um, at 35000 feet um the um these uh, i'm sorry i i just give me one minute please um i need to hush up to call isabel I apologize. Um, so we were talking about economies of scale and I was explaining that the European system has 63 um, area control centers in its airspace. The um, American airspace uh, um, has, a similar, has a similar size. Um, it has more movements because the aircraft is smaller and, and, and it has between 50% um, more traffic um, and only 20, 21 centers. So we know that, um, that the fragmentation is probably an issue. We can also talk about protectionism, so the power of labor unions, and the fact that the member states, for example, have not pushed the um, FABs to come into existence. Um, air traffic controllers are paid very nice salaries, and we know that um, there's kind of no desire for, for these jobs to go anywhere else. And the, even at the EU level, there has been weak regulation, as we just discussed. And finally, of course, what we want to try and figure out is how to increase the capacity. This needs to be done technologically because there's only so many sectors that you can create. So what I should explain is if this is our airspace, Okay, at night we'll have two controllers working it. And then in the morning, gradually, as the um, uh, movements um, start up, what we will do is we will split that area space into two sectors. And we will keep splitting up our spaces um, as more and more traffic um, continues. There's a limit to how many sectors you can actually produce. Uh, Kalswa, I think, is up to 12 or somewhere in that region and probably can't do more than that. So the best way to increase capacity is through technologies. Um, and aside from the money that's already been spent on developing those technologies, they would still need to be put in place. And according to the European Union Master Plan, which they published in 2012, the, the, there they argue that it will cost 30 billion euros in total for it to be in place for CESAR step one by 2030. Um, and about 50% of that cost will be on the airlines for um, setting up their systems on their aircraft and training their pilots and so on. 16% of that is going on the air navigation service providers, the en route part, um, and another 6% on the airports at, at the, at, at the uh, tower level. So. Why has this not been done? Why have uh, these technologies not really been employed at all? Well, obviously, this is true in many industries where there is a desire for change. There is always a fear of adopting new technologies and what happens if there are issues, viruses, hacking, and so on. And there's obviously an opposition to change, and the labor unions are powerful and do not want uh, to lose um, good jobs. So uh, the point of this work was to look at potential changes that could help us to improve the system. Um, changes could include horizontal integration, like we just discussed the FABs, the functional airspace blocks. Um, another way could be vertical integration. And here the idea is that perhaps there would be an agreement between um, a major airline, its hub in airport, and the local air traffic control prov provider. So the classic example would be Lufthansa at Frankfurt Airport with DFS, which is the German ANSP. Would such a vertical integration help to encourage maybe greater cost efficiency or technology ad adoption? And how would this impact the market? Other choices are to change perhaps the pricing regulation and for the X, percent efficiency that we expect these guys to achieve to be much stricter and based on in individual levels because we have uh, so, some 
some ANSPs in Europe that seem to be relatively uh, quite efficient, cost efficient. That would include, for example, NATS in the UK or MUAC, which is this um, en route uh, provider that covers part of um, Northwest Germany, um, Belgium, Luxembourg and the Netherlands. Um, and they seem to be really uh, relatively efficient, so cutting that, that so a high X would be problematic, as compared to some as compared to some others where you can see inefficiencies in the region of 50%. Another choice would be to encourage perhaps peak and separated off-peak charges, because after all, we are talking about congested airspace, um, and this is one of the perhaps simpler ways, it's not a bottleneck, it's not a changing price on a minute basis, but would at least separate out and pass some information on to the airlines. Or hybrid price caps whereby you could in fact perhaps increase your price cap if you are adopting new technologies. So these are the kind of questions that we are looking at in this work. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, literature that has been published to date, because of course, um, none, no work really starts on its own and it's based on a lot of previous research. And then I'm going to show you a model that we developed, which is a two-stage network congestion game. It's two stages in that in the first stage, the air traffic uh, control providers will be setting their charges. And in the second stage, the airlines will be responding by choosing their flight paths such that they minimize their costs. We're going to have elastic demand, and most importantly, and this is maybe the largest change compared to previous research, is we're assuming that there is an oligopolistic market at both stages. So both the NSPs have market power, but so do the airlines, and this will change substantially the results of this analysis. I'm going to show you um, some analytical results, obviously showing films and proofs is not simple at the easiest times and it's going to be even harder here. So I'm mostly going to just explain the um, what, what, what we've learned from doing this type of analysis. So the intuition lying behind our results. And I will um, at the end show a small numerical result um, with respect to just Western Europe. It, um, it includes six countries um, they serve just under 50% of the aircraft movements in Europe. They cost, they're equivalent to around 52% of the actual costs, but they're also responsible for 65% of the delays. So what we did was essentially reduce the computational uh, side of the story, but still, and, uh, but still a are able to learn something about what's going on in West Europe. Okay. So um, if anyone has a question, there, you're, as I said, you're very welcome to ask. Just turn on your sound and please ask. Okay, in this case, I'm going to continue. Um, and of course, um, there has been a lot of work within uh, the literature on air traffic control. Um, um, and O'Donnell's O'Donnell's work about how we could go about improving um, capacities in, in using technologies, um, and there's also Boju's work with Mark Hansen on how classic cost-benefit analysis doesn't actually properly account for delays, and so um, we need to think carefully about how we can implement these new technologies. Um, and then um, Mike Winston's work where he's arguing that there's a lack of congestion pricing in, in, in the US system, which um, is a problem uh, for passing on information. Um, Luli and O'Donny have a nice paper where they're explaining that there are issues of efficiency and equity that are particularly complicated, for example, in the European Union because of uh, the fact that there's composed of so many different states member states. And then um, there's Lorenzo Castelli's work and also um, Radoslav Jovanovic's work where they started to begin to look at how can we change this system um, and how can we improve on it. But they didn't consider the story of market power. And this is um, one of the main contributions of this work that, that we think um, really impacts how the market should be composed and how we should design the market. Um, 
So we're going to base our work on network congestion games. And when we started looking at these questions, we sort of automatically went to Wardrop because that's, of course, the most famous equilibria way of analyzing a network. Um, and, but there's also the potential games of Resenthal, Mondo, and Chaplet. Um, and the problem here is that they've assumed that there are all the customers are identical. And in Wardrop, that the customers are atomistic. And as soon as we understand that airlines ha have market power, um, which in, in the age of Corona is only going to increase, not decrease, um, this becomes a problem and you don't find potential equilibrium outcome in, internally. So we ended up dropping that and we moved on to subgame perfect Nash equilibria, which is, of course, Selton's um, idea, which does allow customers to consider at least the self-imposed congestion. So we're going to consider non-atomistic and heterogeneous customers with market, power, uh, with market power in the second stage that are going to react to the first stage competitive pricing story. Okay, and this is how it's different from the previous literature. Okay, so first I'm just going to describe a very this is a simple game. In fact, we have a preliminary stage where the government is going to set up rules like, you know, is it going to set price caps and so on and so forth. And then in the first stage, given those rules, the air traffic control providers um, will set peak and off-peak charges according to those rules. And we also have ATC terminal providers in this story. They're important because um, we use them to also um, create slots and to limit the movements um, in the peak hours. Um, and we can use many different ways of um, estimating how these guys behave. We can use a cost recovery story or profit maximization or profit maximization, but with price caps. And then in the second stage, as we discussed, the airlines are going to choose their flight paths. So we're assuming that their schedules are known and that um, they decide how to go from their origin to their destination such that they minimize their costs. And their costs are in fact, it's, there are five components to this story. And the first are the basic uh, cost components that we know. So there's an operational cost, which is going to cover the crew costs, fuel, and so on. There's a congestion cost, because um, if airlines are late or delayed and so on, if it's beyond um, a certain level, they start having to pay their, their uh, passengers for, for those delays. They certainly have to pay um, more for their staff um, and so on. And also they're paying the en route air traffic control charges. All three of these costs are going to, in fact, be, be impacted by the air traffic controller's choices in this story. Um, and I should say that the airlines, from what we can see and how they're behaving, um, are much more worried about the congestion story than they are about the actual charges, because charges make up around 5 to 6 percent of their direct operating costs, whereas congestion would appear to be above 10 percent. Aside from those three basic costs, we're going to add two more. And one refers to a revenue loss when the airline is being pushed off into the off peak. Um, it will, in fact, make less revenues. We have not included airfares in this story in order to uh, minimize the messiness around, around uh, the analysis. Um, so we instead refer to it as a revenue loss in, inside this cost function. Um, and we finally have a one last one last option, which is to choose not to fly. And we need this to ensure elasticity of demand. So if we have a profit maximizing ATC provider, the um, charges could go up substantially. Um, and we need um, the, the provider to understand that then the airlines will, will start reducing the traffic. And finally, I should point out that this congestion co cost here is not really li linear. And we know that as the frequencies increase, the delays are going to increase. 
Now, those delays might be very low at the beginning, but at some point, as we get close to the capacity restrictions, either of the airport itself in terms of slots or the air traffic controllers, we're going to see those delays increasing dramatically. And so we will try to also consider that in this game. Before I show you how we do that, um, I should add that we're going to analyze this game from a system optimal perspective. Were, for example, Eurocontrol able to tell the airlines exactly where to fly, um, and they were then responsible for min minimizing the total cost of the system, both of the first stage ATC providers and of the second stage airlines. But in the real world, we live in user equilibrium world. That is, airlines employ uh, dispatchers, and those dispatchers choose the flight path approximately four hours prior to a flight, such that they are minimizing their costs. Okay, so um, they're going to be at least aware of the delays that they impose on themselves uh, if they're not necessarily aware of what else is going on around the world. Okay, so we look at both the system optimum and the user equilibrium outcome. Okay, so the first stage in ANSP is going to have an objective function in the most basic case whereby they're maximizing their um, revenues, which are their um, charges, less their cost to produce the service. This is per, per kilometer, so then uh, times the kilometers being served. And what we have here are the second stage airline flows. Um, and F star represents the uh, results of the second stage analysis. I'm just going to finish this first. And um, then we have less a fixed cost. CF is because the uh, ATC guys have both variable and fixed costs. And that fixed cost is important when we're talking about adopting technology. Um, I see someone raised their hand. Um, please, please do ask your question. Unfortunately, I can't read your name because it's written in Chinese and my Chinese is not very good. Would someone like to ask a question? Oh, okay. So um, I will continue. All right. So this is a classic profit function and it may or may not be subject to um, a price cap depending on um, the scenario that we're testing. Maladeva, would you like to ask a question? Do you hear me? Yes, I do now. Hello? Ah, okay. Hello, please. Um, uh, can you please elaborate this equation? Maybe not everybody is uh, very familiar with this equation. Uh, what it uh, each represents? Okay, so what we have here is a profit function where we have the revenues less the variable costs multiplied by the demand. And that demand, F star, is a result of the airline choices about how they're going to fly. And so um, the star represents the solution to the um, second stage. Um, and then we have less the fixed costs, and we're going to maybe um, sometimes limit limit that price um, or or charge uh, is what they call it to the airline. Okay, this is the ANSP. Then we go to the second stage airline, which includes a an objective function that's even worse than the one you just saw, but it's simply the five elements that we just discussed. So here we have the operating costs. We have the charge that the, as is being set, and we have the revenue loss from flying in the off-peak. In addition, we have a congestion charge, which is going to have um, be multiplied by frequencies squared. And that's how we take into account the nonlinear element of, um, of the problems of congestion. And we also have the opportunity to not fly at all. So F L O D T here is a decision for, of the airline not to fly. 
So FLODAW is to fly and the FLOD is to not fly. This is going to be subject to a very standard uh, model in operations research. The uh, first line here simply says that all of the flights and non-flights out of an origin have got to meet uh, the airline schedule. And then the second line is for the destination airport that it all needs to flow into the destination. And that at any transit point, because for example, if you're flying from from uh, Rome to London, you're going to fly through multiple airspaces. So there's a transit point at, at which you're being handed over from one ATC provider to another. There the flows have got to sum to zero because what goes in has got to come out. And finally, we're going to include perhaps um, a restriction of slot constraints at, at specific airports. Um, for each airline and finally the standard set of constraints that require that all the decision variables uh, of where to fly and uh, if to fly at all have all got to be uh, strictly non-negative. So this is um, a non-linear objective function but it is uh, it does meet KKT um, restrictions so we can in fact solve this to optimality. Okay, so based on this model, we are now going to move towards a set of analytical results. Um, and analytical results are obviously not simple to do, um, and therefore we ha are doing it on what's called, what, what I would say is a relatively simplified network. And um, this means um, that we have at the moment three service providers in this story. We have um, C, A, and B. We have both parallel and serial network here. In particular, if we want to go from origin zero as an airline to destination four. We have a part of this story where we are in fact a captive audience. We have to use service provider C to get to our origin one. So um, th th for this, we have no choice. But then when we are figuring out how to go from one to four, we can choose to go either through service provider A or through service provider B. So there is theoretically some competition here for customers in this network. Okay, so we are going to talk about asymmetric service collaboration where we've got homogeneous customers wanting all of them want to fly for the for, for the first couple of um, results from zero to four okay so through C and then either A or B and we're going to describe unregulated competition with this asymmetric service collaboration and what we find first of all is that there is a unique user equilibrium um, with a very specific um, demand potential demand threshold is potential because in fact airlines could choose not to fly if the service is considered too expensive compared to the outside option okay and that um, demand threshold is going to um, increase uh, in the number of customers and the outside option cost and decrease in the service cost of the providers the operating costs of the airlines and the airlines congestion costs and here's what we find. And I would say, um, first of all, please look at the moment only at the blue. Blue is the competitive solution outcome, where C, A, and B are three suppliers working individually. What we can see um, on the left-hand graph is the service provider charge on the y-axis, and on the x-axis is, is demand. In the second graph, we can see the flows of the airlines as a function of the demand. If we look at the first graph, what we can see here at the beginning is we're, we're looking at the blue threshold. So up to the blue threshold, we see that um, providers A and B are charging rel relatively low prices that do uh, gradually increase um, with the, the increase in demand, okay? The, because we're going to assume symmetry in this um, analytical 
um, analysis. Basically, A and B will simply split the market equally. Um, and then as congestion grows, so they will choose to slightly increase their charges, as you can see, up to this threshold. The monopolist, on the other hand, C, is going to have a different policy. Can I ask one question? Um, yes. I, I, on, the, on the horizontal axis, you have the total demand, but I, I'm a little bit confused because the, the demand is supposed to be endogenous. Uh, so is this some sort of parameter that determines the aggregate sort of the market size in, in a way or? What, what we do is we show is what is happening as demand grows. So if, okay. you, if you're sitting, you're sitting in, in, in a low demand market here, Okay, this is what we would expect to happen. We would expect A and B to set very low charges and C to be setting relatively high charges. If on the other hand, our market is above, uh, above this threshold, we would see a different story. Okay. So it depends on where the market is sitting at any particular point in time. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, so um, what we were saying was that the monopolist C is going to start with a very high charge in D, and um, um, as congestion grows, in order to ensure that flow continues, okay, it's continuously balancing the congestion costs of the airlines to the um, no-fly option, and so it will gradually decrease its charge for in, in its own airspace. Once oh, we sorry. Uh, do, uh, do, I have one. Sorry, one minute. Uh, to yes, understand very very simply that uh, it is uh, the de uh, the demand and the service provider charge is indirectly proportion. As the demand increases, the service provider charge decreases. Is correct? That's what we find okay. from the analytical um, yeah. analysis okay. of, of the fact. Yes. Okay. And then when we get uh, above this particular threshold. What we see is that the charges suddenly remain constant. So A and B remain down here, and C remains up here. And what that means is that um, more and more of the flow is not being met. Okay, they're choosing to uh, stop, stop flying. And so what we can see in this, uh, the right-hand side graph is if there was an efficient system optimal approach, where the um, charges are equal to the cost of producing air traffic control, we have this green line up here. These are the efficient flows. And so we're talking about the competitive market here. And what we see is that um, the flows continue to increase up to the threshold, and then they remain constant, and they are below the efficient level. OK, so in other words, the charges are too high. And so our corollary for, from analyzing this story is that uh, if, if a price cap is set by the government and it's approximately equal to the operational cost of the ATC guys and does not include a congestion cost, then the price cap will in fact always be lower than the unrestrained equilibrium charges. And because that is the case, we can um, see excessive congestion, inefficient flows, and no technology adoption, which I believe is what we actually see in the real world at the moment. OK, I'm going on to theorem two, which is looking at exactly the same story. But now we're saying, what happens if there is horizontal integration, just like the fabs we talked about at the beginning of this talk, um, between C and A? And they continue to compete with B. So now we can go back to that same graph, uh, two, two graphs, but now instead of the um, blue part, we would want to concentrate on the red part, the integration of A and C. And what, what, we, what we can see very clearly in this story now, um, I hope, is um, up and uh, first of all, the threshold has moved, and it's moved um, to the right. And up until that threshold, they're in fact behaving very similarly to the competitive situation. But once beyond that threshold, what do, what do we see here? We see in fact that A and C together 
charge slightly less. So C, C is charging more, but A is charging less than B. And, com and combined, the AC uh, is charging less, and therefore the flows under the integrated network are higher and closer to the efficient flow. So um, <clears throat> there is an impact from um, this integration. And not only is there an impact, but perhaps um, something that sounds interesting, it is preferable to the competitive case. So our corollary true, to, which is very different to what's been published in the literature to date, is that horizontal integration may, may lead to coordination of charges and in fact lead to greater efficiency by decreasing overall social cost. And we find this because of the type of network that we're looking at and we are considering both congestion and, and um, serial and parallel networks. Okay, so I'm going to move on because I also see that the time is moving. Um, and what I'm going to talk about is one other set of analytical results where we have heterogeneous customers. Okay, so now we're going back to this graph, we're going to ignore C for the moment. We're going to talk about traffic that is going from origin one to destination four, which we'll have to choose between A and B. But also there will be traffic from one to two, and one at the airport and one to three, a different airport, this demand is captive, okay? They, they have no choice as to which provider they use, um, um, but if going from one to four, it still leaves you with choice. This means that for the ANSP, they have heterogeneous customers. They have both captive audience and a flexible audience or uh, customer. So what we see in this case, in, I, I should first point out, what we have on the x-axis is the, uh, the flexible demand in comparison to the captive demand. So as we move along the x-axis, the uh, flexible demand is increasing relatively. And what's important here is in fact the relative demand. Um, and again, we have a potential demand threshold. At the very beginning, um, if we talk, we're talking about the com competitive case at the moment, the blue, the blue lines. We can see that um, A and B both set very high charges at the beginning when there is low flexible demand. So they basically just don't serve any flexible demand. It disappears, dissipates, and they serve only the captive demand. But as that flexible demand increases, in the competitive case, one of these NSPs, and I can't say A or B because it's a symmetric story, one of them drops their charge and starts serving all of the flexible demand. The other one stays at the very high price up until that threshold point. And then basically what happens is as congestion grows, they do slightly reduce their charges up to a point beyond which simply uh, they're not serving all of the demand. And what we can see on the right uh, on the right hand side here is the in the efficient case, indeed, you would continue to serve the growing flexible demand, but under competition, you do not. You you stop at some point. Now, this this is true for the competitive market, but what happens when there is horizontal integration of these providers A and B? So in other words, we now essentially have a monopoly. Okay, so we're back to, in fact, the same slides that we saw before, but now I'm going to talk about integration, which is the, the red line. So now we have a single provider, and what we see is that that very high charge lasts a little bit longer than the competitive stage, but at some point, it will drop the charge, and it will keep dropping it, until, until it's no longer worthwhile because uh, the congestion is substantial and so the flexible demand will slowly disappear. And here we can see that in this case, indeed, um, the integration is no less efficient in terms of flows and overall social costs than the competitive case. 
So our final corollary that I'm going to talk about, there's more, there's more results in, in, in the paper, if you would like, would, would, is that there is pressure to merge for, merge for ATC providers to start merging. And the argument is that they will lower their production costs due to economies of scale. However, the cost of a single server does not in fact impact the charge that they want to set to the airlines. There is, of course, a separation. So the lower costs will not lead to lower charges without the presence of regulation. And in that case, the merger may not lead to higher efficient flows. OK, so our results are, um, um, I guess, a little bit more complicated uh, than, than uh, regulators would like because it really does depend on where you are lying on this story. So how um, much flexible demand do you have in comparison to the captive demand? Because this will clearly impact how our providers will behave. Okay, uh, so Nicole, what I want me? to do... Yes. Uh, I'm Akeem, sorry for interrupting. Right? No, Willie. Oh. But, Hi, Willie. Also from Berlin. So. Um, my question is, I'm just curious, um, you're talking about that one provider would um, would change the charges. About what time frame do we talk? Do we talk about ages? Do we talk about uh, months? Or in what time frame do they adjust their, their charges? That's actually an excellent question. So we're not looking at um, um, any sort of revenue management story here. So we just looked uh, at it as, on an annual basis. Okay. Okay. Um, but we did look over time. So, so all of our results kind of looked at uh, the data I'm about to show you is for 2011. Then we looked at 2020 and 2030 up to 2050. So okay. we were looking at an annual change. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. So I'm going to show you in the very short time I have left a very few uh, numerical results for the West European case study that we discussed. And I just want to show you, okay, so if we have six, six providers, you can see the colors of these providers based on the arcs. You can see the, 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 the red nodes as being airports and the little green nodes are the transit points that we've been discussing. And what we've been talking about is how much captive demand do we have versus, um, versus flexible. And here's a very simple example. I don't know if you can see that green line gradually growing. Um, if you were flying from Manchester to London, you would be a captive audience. If you're flying then from London onto Frankfurt, well, then you could choose to go through Dutch space, Belgian space or French space and so on. And this is more the flexible demand that we've just been discussing. So inside this case study, we basically have what, what I've just shown you from the analytical story. In the first stage, we modeled, in fact, 15 um, players. We have six um, en route air navigation service providers covering the six countries. And then we have nine um, airports in this story. We have the larger airports and a few smaller airports. They're, they're, they're what allow us to create this captive uh, demand. In the second stage, Europe has about 160 airlines at any point in time flying around the sky. Um, I actually needed to finish this work in a reasonable amount of time. So we uh, modeled five airlines. Three of them are the alliances that we know of and of course that way we can say for example Lufthansa is going to use Frankfurt and Brussels since Brussels Airlines is uh, in fact owned, fully owned by Lufthansa um, and One World so BA be, being owned by IAG together with um, Iberia so it will use Madrid and so on. So we have the three alliances. Then we looked at low cost carriers. We thought about Ryanair being the largest um, carrier, but uh, it is ultra low cost, or at least it has been until the recent set of strikes. So we chose um, to use EasyJet instead. It's the fourth largest uh, airline in Europe. And finally, we wanted to uh, include all of the non-European carriers. The largest one, I believe still today is Emirates. So these are the five airlines that, that we have used in this study. And the first thing I have to say is what, what we try to do is reproduce 
the existing outcome in 2011 to show that this model, in fact, uh, does describe what was going on. And we could see that the user equilibrium cost recovery solution is very close to what was happening in the real world. Inside this story, you can see the um, airline costs, and these are the casks, um, and they're uh, relatively close to actually what happens. In 2011, we could we could also measure the profits of the of the air traffic controllers. The only one at that time that was losing money was uh, DFS Germany, and in, in, indeed, on average, although these ANSPs are supposed to be making no profits, they're making around 20% profits. So this is again a sort of reasonably accurate picture of what's going on. For the airport air traffic control, it's slightly more complicated story because um, in countries like uh, Belgium, there's in fact a cross subsidy and the Belgian en route is subsidizing the air traffic control at the airport, which is why you can see theoretically a loss at Brussels airport. Um, and this is a choice of their government and, and who am I to argue with them? But so, so we, we were kind of reproducing the outcome and then we said, well, what if? Okay, I'm only going to show you two, to maybe three results. So what if there is horizontal integration just like the fabs that we were talking about? What we slowly, what, what, what of course dawned on us was, well, what charge would they make? There's no real discussion about, would it be the same charge in all in the airspace once it has been integrated or can they charge per region according to their costs? So what I'm showing you here is where we simply took a weighted average. So for example, here we have Belgium and France integrating. We took a weighted average uh, charge as the price cap in, in this set of results. And we can see that if that was the case, the fab should actually be slightly better off, making slightly higher profits. But um, most of the airlines are worse off. Okay, why, why is this? Because uh, the French airspace is cheaper than the Belgian one. Once you have a, an average weighted cost, so the French airspace becomes slightly more expensive. This is not in the interest of the airlines. And it didn't matter which horizontal integration we kind of looked at, there were always uh, airlines that were worse off. And this perhaps explains why IATA and the airlines themselves have not worked very hard at pushing the ANSPs to integrate horizontally. I would add one more, more argument here. So MUAC, the airspace that uh, I was talking about. So, so let's just say what happens if there was horizontal integration between Germany, Belgium and the Netherlands. And not only that, they set their charge at the lowest price, which in this case in year 2011 was Germany. All of our airlines would be very happy with this story. However, of course, the, um, the, the new fab is making even larger losses than the, uh, the the individual profits and losses of the three. Horizontal integration doesn't work when you look across all of the stakeholders. And this is why the 2004 law ha has not been put into place, in, in, at least in my opinion. Then we also looked at technology. Okay, So we took data from the... Um, the European master plan, that 30 billion dollars uh, euros um, and how it was split. And we took what they said um, it, it would do. So it would be reducing congestion by 27 um, percent and, and so on and so forth. We took all of those values and we looked at, well, what would happen in 2011, but perhaps more interesting by the time it's actually supposed to be implemented, which is in 2030. And we, of course, um, assumed um, a demand growth based on um, what was ca what's coming out of the European Union. And they claimed that comparison to 2011, there would be close to 40% increased uh, demand. We can see that uh, for the airlines, adopting these technologies is worthwhile overall. It's, it's relatively marginal, but it will help. On the other hand, under the rules defined in the in the um, master plan, whereby, for example, the NSP's uh, charges were supposed to come down by 6%. Um, sadly, it's not in any of their interest to adopt this technology. And so, without changing the current system, uh, Cesar will stay um, 
on, in people's brains and on paper and not be adopted that have to change the pricing policies um, and charges uh, the system um, of air traffic control. Otherwise, the technolo technologies will also not be adopted. And one last um, solution, uh, solution here I wanted to show you is what happens if there's simply vertical integration. Um, so I don't mean like a fab, but what I mean is that a group come up with an agreement to adopt the technologies only in the relevant airspace. So for example, if Lufthansa spent the money on Cezal, um, and so did DFS, Frankfurt Airport in, in Germany, what we can see here is that coalition would be worthwhile for three of the four players. So the smaller airports would not gain from this and would need encouragement. Um, but it would be worthwhile for, for a, a, like a vertical integration to occur for these three main players. This is true um, in the French coalition that we looked at and not true in Spain. So in other words, um, some of these technologies are worthwhile. It will be a function of the level of congestion that is really in existence, the growth in demands in the different places. And we're kind of saying that perhaps a bottom-up approach might be better than the top-down European approach that's trying to force um, the uh, horizontal integration, even when the NSPs clearly have no interest in doing it from a profit perspective. Okay, so I will just sum up by saying, um, when you consider network effects and congestion levels, Competition does not necessarily improve efficiency. And perhaps integration is a good idea in this story. One of the ways to integrate would be to privatize this system and to reduce auctions and allow member states every five years or so to start choosing their providers. Those providers are likely to win more than one airspace and thus that could lead to a a defragmentation of the airspace um, and more efficiency than exists today. So this is our main sort of title of this paper. Price caps in congested networks are efficient because they do not take into account the congestion. They do not include signals. They lead to inefficient flows and higher social costs than are necessary. So price cap regulation does not work when you have network effects and congestion. Um, when you want to trust competition, um, that, that's always nice, but it's only relevant when the flexible demand is sufficient to uh, encourage the providers to behave. So what's really, really important is to understand the level of flexible demand versus captive demand. Um, and finally, uh, vertical integration could in fact encourage um, the internalization of con congestion and incentivize technology adoption uh, simultaneously. So this is perhaps one of the potential possibilities for the European Union to start um, considering uh, how to change the system. That's one, one potential way. Um, and I'd just like to say thank you so much for listening. Um, and um, if you have any questions, I, I would be very happy to hear them. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, Pois from Luxembourg. And I have a small question, if, if I may. Uh, first, first, thank you very much for the nice presentation. It's quite clear. Um, why do you assume that the providers are profit maximizers rather than break even? Um, so, so to be fair, fair to this analysis, we in fact tried many things. We tried also simply uh, maximizing revenues. We tried uh, profit maximization, and then we of course also tried uh, cost recovery. And the underlying takeaways are all the same. Thank you. And so what we wanted to do was understand whether if we, if so, so there's some papers in the literature that say that uh, there is enough uh, 
the flexible demand to ensure that uh, the ANSPs will behave properly. And that was my, the first question I had in my mind. So we ran this profit um, optimization story without the price caps to try and understand uh, what would happen. And the charges increased uh, by a magnitude of s somewhere between 6 and 10, 10 times the size. And so it was very clear to at least me in this case study that we're a long way from having sufficient flexible demand to ensure that ANSPs can continue without price caps. Okay. No, thank you. So basically, it's fairly robust to this assumption. Absolutely. And, and one tiny clarification. So the charges they are setting are per kilometer, correct? Yes, that's okay. correct. Um, I, I cheated, of course. So, so it's also a function of the size of the aircraft. Yeah. So um, I kind of ignored that. What I did was just assume a 150-seat aircraft, like a standard-sized aircraft for everything. Also for the analytics and for this case study. And so is it also a function of speed or basically the time they spend in the in the air or in to the best of my knowledge? Yeah, yeah, I understand. In, in to the best of my knowledge in practice it's done um, not by flight hours, the charging story, it's done by flight kilometers controlled. Okay, very interesting. So basically have the incentive to take the shortest path uh, through the country. Um, definitely not. Okay, because across Europe, there is a huge pattern of different levels of charges. So it's very well known that um, all airlines will try to avoid Swiss airspace. Um, what they'll do in that five, four hours before they choose their flight plan is they'll balance the cost of the fuel and the labor with the cost of the NSPs. And so we know that on average, they're, they're flying around 50 kilometers more than they really need to because for that reason. That's very interesting. Thank you. Uh, maybe I, I just add that we can stay open until everyone everyone has uh, time to answer the question. So uh, for me, there is no time restrictions. I don't know. If, how about you, uh, Nicole? I do have to tell you that today is actually Israel Independence Day. And so oh. um, I'm supposed to be with my family, but I'm quite okay. happy to go so on. Go on to to give the audience for asking questions. Like, uh, uh, as a question. Yes, uh, I, I mean, uh, intuitively, the argument that price caps are not working in in a situation where there is excess uh, demand and congestion, I mean that that is intuitively clear. I mean that would you ex expect because uh, it fixes the price. Uh, uh, below the equilibrium price. Now, uh, what price caps are, one of the arguments for price caps has always been that the price structure is free. I, so I guess you haven't modeled or haven't put in the model uh, the price structure. So meaning with, I mean, with price cap regulation, you, you have incentives for peak and off peak pricing. That that won't happen. That, that will not happen if if there's excess demand uh, for the whole period, but in the period in the phase before. So, so, that's so the, I, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, Hans Martin. Please please continue. No, no. That that's what I just wanted to have your re reaction to. So, sorry. Um. So I'm um, the price cap story is extremely complicated. Um, and what, what we would say is that we want to try and avoid it. So we want to try and encourage competitive markets um, and thus get rid of the regulators because they're really weak and they're incapable of actually setting real price caps. Um, furthermore, we're talking about congested networks. Price caps don't work. We have to find a different solution. One of them is the privatization and auctioning story. Another one is allowing vertical integration. Um, we have to find an alternative way.
Yeah, not sure whether I really buy that, but uh, I, I see you. you that, well, <laughs> as a past regulator, I completely understand your position. <laughs> um, what you would say, of course, is that you believe in hybrid hybrid price caps. Yes. No, 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 no. Can they? No, no. I think. Can I think they with, include with, congestion? I mean, with congestion, you well, if, if, the, the, the if you the question is how you ration. But I'll, I'll uh, um, I, I take your point, so that that's okay. <laughs> uh, I'm Hadeva. Sorry, I have one question. Can I ask? Please. Okay. Um, I want to know: Is there any regulatory or the, any body which is regulating the charges of the ANSP? For example, like, is there any regulation driven by ECO uh, so that the charges will be um, charged to the airliner currently, uh, something like this? So, so that's a very nice question. Thank you. So um, ICAO promotes the idea that the charges should be set at the actual costs. Plus, maybe a small percentage to ensure that they don't go bust when, when there's, a, you know, like a a reduction in demand overnight um, and the problem with cost plus regulation is that it encourages the NSPs to be, behave very inefficiently in terms of their costs so they um, will have too many employees or they will have um, a very high wages um, or even both so there's a lovely paper by um, Proust um, from last year that shows exactly that happening across Europe um, in, in the United States, it's a very different story. Um, they, they, they do it differently. They have uh, passengers also paying charges. So, so it is different in different places around the world. Um, we, we don't want to uh, encourage regulation. We want to try and, I think, try to figure out how to encourage competition to, to improve this market. The um, airlines were deregulated. Right, the, the airlines uh, deregulated overnight in the U.S. like 30 plus years ago, and around 20 years ago in in the, in Europe. Um, then then the airports started to be deregulated or privatized or commercialized. This is the very last major link in the um, aviation supply chain that has yet to be um, separated from from the government, oh. and I think. I think it's about time. Ah, uh, okay. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I think uh, because there is, uh, if I understand correctly, uh, Nicole, you mentioned that there is an Independence Day in Israel and that you want to see your family. So I think you really earned uh, I think everyone agrees that you really earned your, you know, family gathering and uh, enjoying the public holiday in uh, in Jerusalem in Israel. So thank you very much. It was a wonderful presentation, and um, and you know we also had a very good discussion. So I also want to th thank all the participants for asking the question, and I would uh, first everyone to virtually clap hands uh, very heavily. For or for Nicole for this wonderful presentation. And please come back next week for our next uh, seminar talk by uh, Jospan Omerin about uh, frequent flyer programs. You're all welcome. So thank you very much. And uh, we will stop the recording right now and then I will we will close the session. Okay, so thank you very much again, uh, Nicole and everyone. And uh, hopefully see you next week. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.